Et on y va. Donc, uh, hello everybody, bonjour à tous. Uh, welcome to this panel that's jointly organized by the Armenian General Benevolent Union of Canada and the Armenian Bar Association, which has members in Canada and the United States. Uh, my name is Varur Makalian. I'll be moderating our discussion today. Uh, we are pleased and honored to have three panelists today for a discussion which we hope will allow us to understand where Canada presently stands with regards to the crisis in Artsakh, what has been done so far, what is being done now, and what Canada can still do. Uh, the first uh, panelist I'd like to present is Alexandre Boulris, who is a member of parliament for Rosemont La Petite Patrie in Montreal under the banner of the NDP. He's a longtime member and vice chair of the Canadian Armenian Parliamentary Friendship Group. Uh, so thank you for being, us, uh, being with us, Mr. Boulris. Uh, My pleasure. And we have the, uh, our second panelist is the Honorable Leo Roussakos, who's a senator uh, from Quebec and former speaker of the Senate. Uh, senator Roussakos, of course, tabled a motion calling upon Canada to recognize Artsakh in late 2020, and we'll have a chance to, to speak about uh, that motion too later on. Uh, he's a member of the Conservative Party, Party of Canada. And our third panelist is Anais Kadiam, who is a litigation lawyer from Montreal, member of the Quebec Bar, and the co-author of a brief that was circulated within government and academic circles, arguing for Canada's obligation to recognize the independence of Artsakh. Uh, the brief and all the additional documentation that goes with it is available on the Armenian Bar's website. So I must uh, mention before we start that the AGBU did extend invitations to three Liberal MPs, Mr. Brian May, Chair of the Canadian Armenian Friendship Group, uh, Mr. Rob Oliphant, who is the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Foreign Affairs, and Ms. Emanuela Lambrokoulos, uh, who is the local MP for Saint Laurent. All three unfortunately declined despite many arrangements that we proposed. Uh, Mr. May or Mr. Oliphant, uh, we would have truly appreciated their participation due to their respective positions. Alas, uh, they really did not seem available. I do want to thank, uh, thank our present panelists for their tremendous flexibility in, uh, in uh, trying to allow everybody to be present at the same time, including an MP for the government party. All right, so uh, without further ado, let's jump uh, quick, uh, quickly into, uh, into the topic. Uh, the first uh, issue I want to address is how Canada has reacted so far in terms of uh, the war in Artsakh, the humanitarian crisis that followed. And perhaps a good starting point would be uh, on October 5. So uh, a week after the war started, uh, after the Azerbaijani aggression started, rather, uh, the Foreign Affairs Minister of the time, uh, Mr. Champagne, sta uh, uh, stated that Canada is now su suspending export permits to Turkey. Uh, because there were allegations or evidence that uh, mil Canadian made military technology is being used in the war in Artsakh. Uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs also announced um, uh, an investigation that is still ongoing. Now, luckily, uh, the House of Commons Foreign Affairs uh, Committee uh, launched its own uh, inquiry, and that was uh, Mr. Bouleris, that was thanks to a motion presented by uh, Mr. Dan Harris, your colleague. Um, if I could uh, quickly ask you for an update on uh, the, what that committee has found out so far. So where are we in terms of the advancement of this study by the committee? How many more meetings are expected? And when can we actually expect a report? Uh, <clears throat> it's a, a lot of uh, very good <laughs> questions. Um, and, you know, the work of the committee is, is uh, undercurrent and is, it's flowing. So they have a lot of studies at the same time. So it's difficult to put a time frame, but I, I think it's quite clear right now that the uh, we have to revisit, uh, you know, our, our our arms deals with with uh, Turkey and Azerbaijan. It was clearly Canadian technology involved in in the use of some drones uh, that were targeting uh, civilian population, and this is in contradiction with our international obligations. Um, so. Uh, my colleague Jack Harris would have more details about, about it, but uh, it's a very important uh, investigation for us. And uh, I'm proud that it's the NDP member who, uh, who tabled it. And, and I, I think uh, if we want to be honest with our own values and principles, this is something that we need to change. But we also need to look at the, uh, the influence of arms lobbyists in Ottawa and uh, particularly some lobbyists who wants to... Uh, to sell arms to regime that are not always democratic or not do not respect human rights. Uh, of course, today we are talking about Turkey and Azerbaijan, but let's say that other examples like Saudi Arabia, the Canadian record is not very good on it. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, last week, there were documents uh, produced at the committee, so on the request of the committee, both uh, Foreign Affairs, uh, actually all for the Foreign Affairs, the Ministry of Foreign, uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs and the PCO submitted a large trove of documents uh, uh, for, uh, for the committee's consideration. And uh, 
a few conclusions that we can draw really quickly looking at the documents. One is that suspending the permits did not change anything, and uh, the, the, uh, the bureaucracy knew it, that everything that, that, that was attached to the permits had already been exported. And Turkey also alleged that it would only be used, uh, this technology would only be used to defend civilians. Uh, Mr. Rusakos, uh, you've been uh, active on this uh, issue too uh, uh, in the Senate. Uh, do you have any comments on uh, what, what has come out of those documents so far? Well, um, I want to address your, your initial points. Number one, uh, I, I compliment the initiative of MP Harris, and of course the opposition is doing their very best to get to the bottom of a very serious issue. But we like to say in Parliament very often that governments, when they, they usually send items to committees to die, uh, and to just drag along as long as they can, because as MP Bulletis pointed out, committees are very busy uh, and they're always fighting for time. Now, I'll say the following, that they also, and let's not forget the prime minister and the government initiated a departmental review of this decision. Uh, and it's already been now, we're into the third, fourth month of that request. Uh, this government has been notorious about being secretive and not being forthcoming with information. And if you or I or anyone ever see anything tangible coming out of this supposed investigation from global affairs, uh, let me know about it. I'm not holding my breath. The sad reality is we know the truth. Two plus two is always four. In April of 2020, there was a rec on the record call between Prime Minister Trudeau and Mr. Erdogan. And a few weeks later, there was a bypassing of our own embargo, the own embargo of the government in making sure military technology doesn't find its hands into Turkey's, uh, Turkey's military capacity. And it has. And we've seen now over the last few years, this so-called NATO ally use various technology, Canadian technology in Syria, in, in Artsakh, in their constant aggression in the Aegean, and the Trudeau government refuses at every turn to call out Turkey. That is the most egregious thing I've ever seen from any government, regardless of political stripes, in my lifetime. Uh, thank you for that. Now, uh, if you look at the, the, the documents and the, the, the brief that was submitted to the minister, uh, the, the, the request for exemption, uh, you have the bureaucracy, Global Affairs Canada, that is saying we have received assurances that they will only be served for civilian purposes or defensive purposes. Now, to the extent that we know that that was a lie, uh, what can Canada's reaction be? Do we just simply say, well, well, we were lied to, or can we expect a reaction from Canada, or should we expect a reaction from Canada? And I uh, open the floor to uh, all three of you. I think quite, quite quickly, I think we should expect a re reaction of Canada. You know, it's, it's clearly against the terms of the arms trade uh, treaty, and, and uh, we uh, repetitively, we are uh, in involved in those kinds of, of, of arms cells that are hurting civilians and, uh, and civil population. So should have consequences on our relation with Turkey maybe, uh, and, 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 and look at what, is, what kind of pressure we can, we can do inside NATO or maybe on an economic level on this. You know, both, both should be uh, looked at. And I will reiterate that what is going on in Artsakh was not a, was not a war. Many refer to it as a war. It was an invasion. It was an invasion by Azerbaijan with the full military and political support of Turkey. Uh, it was done, of course, with the green light effect of the of the Russians, who uh, were nothing more than the historic uh, godfather of the Caucasus, and they were let's call a spade a spade. They didn't like the fact that Armenia decided to go ultra democratic, ultra transparent, ultra accountable in terms of their governance, and. Russia decided to say, you know what, there's a consequence that is paid. And the behavior of governments like Canada and other democracies in the world to turn our back and bury our head in the sand on the only democracy in that region of the world is really unacceptable, completely unacceptable. So there's blood on our hands. The technology by LR3 have been proven now by independent media sources around the world to have been used in this conflict. It was used to kill innocent civilians, men, women, and children. And what we did is the Canadian government played the innocent bystander, a uh, very subtle uh, outcry on the part of the Minister of Foreign Affairs when it was after the fact. And quite frankly, we need to do more. We need to stand up and send the message that as a member of NATO, there's a certain behavior that's expected of a fellow ally. And we haven't seen it from Turkey. We haven't seen it again in the Aegean. We didn't see it in Syria. We didn't see it uh, in Artsakh. And more importantly, we don't even see it in terms of their democratic and free governance standards within Turkey. 
Uh, Senator Usakos, you mentioned that uh, we have blood on our hands because this is Canadian te technology that's been used. Uh, and, and nice if I can uh, draw you in on that. Uh, in the brief that uh, that you co-authored, that I should, for the sake of transparency, say that I am also one of the co-authors of that brief, uh, you argue that, um, uh, the brief argues uh, essentially that because uh, Canada does have blood on, on its hands, it has an additional responsibility to act. Now, if you can present... Um, uh, the, the, the legal argument for Canada's responsibility to take action and what that action might look like. Uh, please go ahead. On, on the basis, again, that once again, Canada evidently does seem to have blood on its hands. Yes, of course. Thanks, Verruid. Um In fact, as we outline in our brief, uh, the case for Canada's recognition of Artsakh, what the situation is now is that Canada has not lived up to its legal obligations and its moral obligations. There is a international legal doctrine called the responsibility to protect. This applies to all states. Canada was one of the pioneers of this legal doctrine. And what it says is that states have a responsibility among others to prevent and to protect civilians from atrocity crimes, from genocide, from human rights violations, from war crimes, and to do everything and to do anything in fact. Doing nothing is never enough. And in, in the case of Canada, not only is it bound by this international obligation to protect civilians when it sees that they are uh, being bombarded, civilians and civilian infrastructures were literally the object of bombardments. 85% um, of the population of Artsakh fled. Uh, that's enormous. The, the, the goal here was to rid Armenians of the region, as Aliyev said, to chase them away like dogs. Uh, you have this obligation that is in fact triggered and the Global Center for Responsibility to Protect even issued an atrocity alert on this. Genocide scholars uh, wrote open letters to governments of the world explaining that we are witnessing an attempt to commit genocide by Azerbaijan and Turkey. And the fact that Canada had um, in fact put weapons in the hands of these perpetrators is what we believe uh, gives them an additional duty to act and not to simply what they have done so far, uh, issue very neutral statements about uh, asking for hostilities to end, asking for violence to end, and asking for negotiations to, to both parties. In fact, what Canada has done is conflated neutrality with objectivity. In order to be objective in a situation like this, you go and find out the facts and you respond to those facts. And if you're part of that responsibility, if those facts show that you actually assisted in committing uh, you know, the displacement of, of thousands of people and, and the death of thousands of people and you know, thousands of children are, are left without fathers, thousands of mothers are left without sons, uh, 40,000 people have lost their homes and the drone technology used in this case was instrumental to, to, the, to, to creating this crisis. So when you have that, what we call on the government of Canada to do is to step up to its responsibilities legally and morally and as uh, the senator and um, Mr. Boularis mentioned to also pr protect the values and the moral, moral obligations Canadians have and to speak out against the aggressor because you know if we I like to bring up a quote by Desmond Tutu who said um, if you're neutral in situations of injustice you have chosen the side of the oppressor so Canada cannot be neutral here unless it wants to choose the side of the oppressor and has to say that uh, what happened and who did it was wrong. And there are many ways that it can live up to that obligation of responsibility to protect. And we outlined some of these remedies in the brief. One of them is recognizing the sovereignty of Artsakh to protect the civilian populations from future aggressions. Another one would be to condemn the Azeri Turkish aggression, which is what, for example, the Senate in France has done, to refer Azerbaijan and Turkey to the International Criminal Court, to call on the High Commissioner of Human Rights to um, establish a commission to investigate, to permanently uphold uh, armed suspension uh, to Turkey, and to provide much more robust humanitarian to Artsakh, which uh, you know is is not the case here. And and in the current situation, there's also the fact that there's a number of POW prisoners of war who are at risk of uh, atrocities and human rights violations, and Canada has not taken a position to protect them internationally. So they have failed in their obligations under the responsibility to protect and in their and in accepting their additional duty as complicit or uh, favoring the commission of these crimes. 
to 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 draw on uh, th thank you thank you for the explanations to draw on one of uh, I guess the, the the primary recommendation would be to recognize the independence of Artsakh under the theory of re remedial recognition. Uh, Senator Rusakos, you presented a motion to that effect in the Senate. Uh, now uh, the, the the communal largest uh, uh, followed the entire debates around it. We know that it was uh, it was defeated and it was defeated um, the tout évidence uh, we could say with. Uh, the, the urging or the approval of the government. Now, uh, I wanted to invite you to speak uh, about the process of uh, uh, presenting that motion, what the government reaction was, and why we did not see much action on it or much back and forth uh, other than what seemed to be an outright rejection by the government. Well, look, I thought when I, uh, when I tabled that motion uh, a while ago, that was the only long-term solution for peace in the region. I believe that's the case today more than ever before. We have a historical reality that the people in that territory have been there for thousands of years. The people in, in Artsakh today are Armenian Christians overwhelmingly. We know the history of how Azerbaijan came to being. We know the history of how Nagorno-Karabakh came to being. It was nothing more than a, a, a happenstance of, of the Stalinist you know, Soviet Union era, nothing more, nothing less. Uh, we've had a referendum do a duly recognized referendum by the free people of Artsakh, which overwhelmingly called for independence. Uh, so you have a homogeneous people. You have a referendum where they clearly spoke. We have the historical reality there in regards to that territory. So my motion just simply called for the recognition of these historical uh, facts, uh, which I thought would have extricated Armenia, would have extricated Azerbaijan from the conflict, and would allow these people to live in self-determination with the freedom which they deserve. What ended up happening was a very short debate in the Senate. Unfortunately, it was only supported by conservative senators. Uh, only conservative senators got on their, their feet to speak to this. Myself, Senator Carignan, uh, Senator No, and a few others. And we saw that the government precipitated the vote, even unexpectedly, and every single Trudeau appointed senator voted against the motion. So it became evidently clear that the government leader in the Senate who pretends on most days to be independent um, and their point person who spoke on it, which is a former senior deputy minister at Foreign Affairs, Senator Bean, my, my, my good colleague, who you know presented nothing more than global affairs and the PMO's talking points, they overwhelmingly voted against the, against the motion. Uh, Mr. Bouleris, if I may ask, um, the, 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 the topic of Artsakh recognition or, uh, or even the conflict in itself did not get much traction or much discussion on the House of Commons side. Uh, yeah. Do you have any insight on that regard or maybe present what discussions, if any, did take place? Uh, yeah, in the House of Commons, the, the discussion was much more focused on, on arms, uh, on drones, uh, on, on a ceasefire and but you know from my point of view we should have a policy that is based on on the right for of the people for self-determination and respect of democratic process so once you say that you should work with other countries in the world to apply those uh, principles to uh, to Artsakh and recognize you the referendum that has been uh, uh, organized a couple of years ago um, but it's some things that we can do in Canadian government should do that could help uh, this process is first it's it's quite simple it's to have a Canadian embassy in Yerevan we don't have a Canadian embassy in Yerevan the Armenian Republic have an embassy in, in Ottawa but not us um, and, and I think it should help us to be much more involved in, in that um, we can also have, have a discussion which uh, why the Republic of Armenia never officially recognized Artsakh either. Uh, it would have been a first country to do it. I, I had conversation with, with ambassadors and I understand the logic at the time. Maybe today we are uh, in another, another space and, and it should be reconsidered. And um, just about, you know, Anais was talking about destruction of, of civil uh, uh, buildings and industries and, and killing of innocent people, like Senator said earlier. We had a meeting at the end of the, uh, of, the of last year. We have a small Artsakh friendship group in Ottawa uh, with uh, MPs from different party, and we we received a presentation 
by, I, I don't know if, if he's called chief investigator or, or ombudsman of, of, uh, of Armenia. And it showed us numerous uh, pictures uh, uh, and graphics and, and uh, really troubling atrocities on the ground. And, um, you know, the, the fact that people were, were killed in, in massive, massive ways, including by some militias from S Syria that Azerbaijan brought there just to terrorize and, and, and kill people. Um, it was a first step for this, for this uh, friendship group, but today we will have other, uh, other meetings. And if I may just add something else, last week we had um, a meeting of the Armenian-Canadian friendship group and uh, with the uh, Armenian ambassador, and we are going to write a letter to Minister Garneau as a friendship group asking for the respect of the ceasefire. And notably, uh, the important thing will be to ask for the respect of the exchange of prisoners. Because Agnes, you, you were talking about it a bit earlier and it ring me a bell. I don't want to forget to tell you that. A letter is coming from the, the friendship uh, uh, group asking for a few things, notably uh, the, the respect of his exchange of prisoners. And if I can jump off on that point, um, Baruj, uh, uh, as Mr. Borelis uh, mentioned, there there is also you know domestic mechanisms that Canada can take and do more seriously than just, for example, what the uh, Armenian Canadian Friendship Group is already taking the great initiative of doing, but to to uh, expand this for example having parliamentary hearings like they've had in the case of the Uyghur or the Rohingya of Myanmar um, and and to really uh, take the, their responsibility seriously and inform members of parliament about the situation more completely. Would, would that be a possibility and the question goes to either uh, Senator Rousakos or Mr. Bulgis to have a parliamentary committee of uh, foreign affairs either in the senate or the house that does a study on the right of the people of Artsakh for self-determination? It's quite possible. It's a question of, you know, discussions with members of those committees and their, their, their priorities. The other thing that we have to keep in mind right now is that maybe we can ask for an, a, a report or a study on, on, a, on an issue, but the, the, real, the real politic is it might never happen because we will have a federal election before it. I would more than welcome a study and a review, but I am so uh, convinced of the historical reality. And, I, and I've always find it a little bit insulting to intellectual intelligence where, where we engage in debates about historical facts. It's when I have public figures say to me, for example, Senator, on your Pontian genocide resolution, it'd be nice if we studied it. I'm saying, study what? You can't study a historical fact. It took so long to recognize the Armenian genocide in our House of Commons in the Senate and by the government of Canada. And to me, it's the epitome of ignorance when you sit around for two decades discussing historical facts. So Artsakh is a historical fact. I'm a student of history. So I look at these factual realities that go back to the fourth century and I look at you know, how it all evolved and I, and I understand where the Aziris come from and how they came to be. And it's not an insult. It's just a recognition of who was there for how long they've been there. And you say to yourself, it's similar to the indigenous debate we have in this country. We can't argue that there's been a problem and that the problem was created by colonialists. Now it's a question of how you solve the problem. Right. And we engage in that discussion. The problem with Turkey doesn't recognize the historical reality. So there's a number of steps uh, that I agree with Anais that are disposable, uh, available to us. One of them is the Magnitsky Act. And I think it's time to start taking action with implementing the Magnitsky Act on Turkey for now their egregious behavior. Uh, and furthermore, take actual quicker sanctions because we have economic ties and political ties with Turkey and we need to send a clear message that their behavior is not acceptable. And I've also argued that we go a step further as a NATO ally and we propose to our NATO allies that when you have a NATO ally attacking and infringing upon the territorial sovereignty of one of our NATO allies, that's no longer a behavior becoming of a NATO ally. So uh, at some point in time, we have to have the courage to say to Turkey, look, you've always pretended to be... Uh, Western when it suited your interest. You always pretended to embrace Western governance when it suited your interest. You've even once upon a time argued that you want to be part of the EU, uh, but yet you behave in a very extremist, jihadist fashion whenever push comes to shove. 
But yet, when that happens, we take the policy of appeasement. And, and I think one of our my two colleague panelists pointed out, when you start being, uh, uh, you, know, you appease the aggressor, they only become be emboldened, and their aggression becomes even worse as time goes on. There, there is a pervading sense, uh, at least within the Armenian community, and I don't pretend to speak on behalf of everybody, but this sense that this is Turkey and Azerbaijan this time getting away with it one more time. And uh, it, it feels like at the beginning of the aggression of the invasion, and you're right to correct the record on that, uh, Senator, it was an invasion. Um, we, uh, there was this sense of international solidarity, but it never actually led to anything. And uh, on the debate uh, on your motion, Senator, Senator Bain's speech, and then the documents that we see from Global Affairs Canada, it almost seems like Global Affairs Canada is always either duped by by what Turkey is saying or is trying to defend Turkey. Now, is this just a misconception on our part or is this because of the NATO, uh, NATO link? When will it be too much? We're living in an era of populism. We're living in an era of disruption and we're leaving, living in an era of economic competitiveness like never seen before. And we have, we have unfortunately been so much engulfed by real politic and self-interest and economic interests that we've become blind and oblivious to human rights, democracy and basic freedom. And even Canada, once upon a time, we were the beacon of hope. And all of us were, were children of immigrants or immigrants that have that come to this land because of what? Our freedom, our democracy, and the fact that Canada would always stand up for doing what's right. And for the last few years, for the first time in my lifetime, regardless of political party that is in power in Ottawa, this is the first time as a Canadian on the international arena, I feel, I feel ashamed that we put petty economic interests ahead of basic human rights and, and, and interests that we, we have to defend as Canadians. And I've said it before and I'll say it again, because Armenia right now doesn't have oil, doesn't have gas, doesn't have uh, economic resources that make it much more palatable for somebody to support them. That's not reason to turn our back to the only democracy in the region that's trying to stand up for what's right. Uh, I what, oh, oh, I was nice. going to say, what we also outlined in the brief is is, is part of what uh, Senator Sakos mentioned about the historical, but also the legal aspect of the fact that uh, Artsakh is a de facto state under international law. But in addition to that, that another remedy in recognizing Artsakh recognition would be through a remedial secession. And, and Canada has issued a landmark decision on this, which is the Quebec secession reference. It recognizes and it has made law on this situation where the right of secession exists in exceptional situations of threat of genocide, of hate uh, crimes, and where a population cannot have internal self-determination. And it's quite naive to expect that things are just the same and all negotiations will go back to the way they were before. No, this recent aggression changed things significantly. The role that the international community and Canada can play uh, is particularly important if it wants to uphold international law. And also in recognizing that, coming back to what Mr. Boulris was saying, Armenia is in a position that, its geopolitical position that's different than Canada. It cannot make such unilateral statements as easily without taking certain risks. Whereas Canada with its like-minded states can be a leader and should and legally is obliged to in this case. Ar Armenia, perhaps uh, in light of what, what we've seen a few months ago, has possibly lost its illusions that other countries would follow suit if, if they took the lead uh, uh, on the issue of recognition. I'm mindful of the time. Uh, I, I do want to address uh, two, uh, two last questions. One of them is, in light of the ceasefire that's, that's currently in place, uh, Anais, maybe you can take the lead on this. Uh, is uh, recognition still the priority? Should it still be the priority? And I would like to hear uh, uh, both parliamentarians on that as well. And my last question uh, for, the, the two member, uh, for the two members of parliament, uh, Senator and member of the House of Commons is, um, I want to raise the issue of the uh, Azerbaijani laundromat scandal. And there's $2.9 billion slush fund that the Azerbaijani government has to uh, pretty much buy off politicians. Uh, we've seen most of it in Europe. Uh, we know that there are uh, former MPs and uh, members in parliament or other politicians who have been arrested, some who have been sentenced, others who have had to resign from office because they did accept bribes from what is a totalitarian regime trying to whitewash its, uh, its name abroad. Uh, has this threat of uh, foreign, uh, foreign influence, almost comically uh, autocratic uh, uh, caricature of foreign influence, has this been addressed uh, 
within uh, uh, either by the Speaker of the Senate or the, the Speaker of the House, you know, just caution, this is a threat. Is Global Affairs aware of this? Has any sensible, sensibilization been done to members of Parliament and Senators on this regard? So that, that is uh, one quick question that I, I, I do find myself obligated to ask you to. And also on the, um, uh, of course, the, the continuing relevance of independence, perhaps even growing relevance of independence. Uh, and I go ahead, go ahead first on that, uh, the, the question of independence, and then I'll let the, the two members uh, speak. I'll keep it short for the interest of time. In terms of the ceasefire, I would, again, caution against the words that we read and the words that we use. It's not a peace deal. It's not, uh, it doesn't create, you know, a final solution. The status of Artsakh is not mentioned in the ceasefire statement. In fact, it's called a statement. It's not a deal. It's not a peace deal. The situation of the Artsakh Armenians is the most vulnerable they've been in the last hundred years, particularly after the ceasefire. There has been a numerous accounts of atrocities happening against civilians, beheadings, skinnings, uh, torture. The hate, the level of hate and violence is hallucinating. And the ceasefire doesn't bring an end to that. It pauses and fr freezes things as it did in 1994. And if Canada and other states believe that things that they can just put their head in the sand, allow things to, 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 to go as they are, we're going to be faced with an, another humanitarian crisis and other atrocity crimes, which is unacceptable. Perhaps the five-year pause is exactly when we should actually work out a final status for Artsakh. In this the, is a, in... a, a golden opportunity to do that and, and to look at the situation for what it is and seriously and how Canada has had an impact and needs to have an impact and take its obligations seriously. Mr. Boulris? Um, yes, and I, I think also that we have to understand what happened in the, the context of a, a global pandemic. So it, it was used as, as, an, as, as a screen to do things that will uh, take less attention because everybody's talking about vaccines and, 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 and hospitals and a lot of uh, other really important stuff. So, uh, it, but it, I agree with Anna is the level of atrocities and violence and hate was horrible, terrible, and it's not over. I don't think Azerbaijan wants to, uh, to stop there. It will come again. And they will use other um, criminals like jihadists to do their uh, with their horrible uh, uh, act of uh, of wars, and they will continue to use uh, uh, cluster ammunition and chemical weapons. We saw white force for um, you know we need to step up and do better because otherwise, hundreds of people and thousands of Armenians in Artsakh will be killed or or this uh, for push away from their, their own lands. Uh, so we have a, a, a responsibility. But uh, on your second question, uh, no, no mention of that from the Speaker of the House of Commons or, you know, I've, I've learned that uh, when I was reading the, the brief for the, for, the, for the meeting. The only thing I know, I, I receive information uh, that I was put on the blacklist of the Azerbaijan regime. So I, I'm really happy with that. <laughs> It's a uh, one man's blacklist is our uh, hall of fame. <laughs> uh, look, I, from my point of view, I'm starting to lose a little bit of hope, but what we need is our the democratic states like Canada to do a virage and to start uh, focusing in on what really is the challenge going forward, because re the real humanitarian atrocities are only beginning now. The truth of the matter is the Azerbaijanis with the Turks are engaging in what is called social reengineering. That's what they're engaging in. Their, their plan is to create migration. The plan is to drive people that have been there for centuries out and re-engineer the cultural and, and demographic makeup of the region. And Turkey has a lot of experience doing that. It's hundreds and hundreds of years. All you need to go back is the cent, you know, century back of who lived in modern day Turkey. So they, they have a pattern of driving out particularly Christians and repopulating areas. So it's sad to say, but it has to be said, and this is what I'm afraid is going on right now. And we can't count on global affairs, it seems. Uh, and only few countries have been really playing a, a, a positive, proactive role. France, I have to compliment uh, Mr. Macron and, and the whole French government for really being vigilant and leading and taking the side of principle on this particular issue. So uh, the next couple of years are critical uh, because we've heard now the Turkish government officials say publicly, 
They want to finish the Armenian genocide that they weren't able to finish 100 years ago. They don't hide it. So when you have these kind of declarations from officials, from a NATO ally, it's really heartbreaking. So that's, I, I think Canada has to up our humanitarian aid to the people of Artsakh. We need to start being vigilant in the area and calling out uh, the egregious behavior of the Azerbaijanis. And we also, through the OSCE, I think Canada hasn't played a strong enough role in, in leading our vision over there. And now I'm going to take it a step further. Unfortunately, I'm starting to lose faith in our current institutions like the UNs and others around the world that seem to be overwhelmed by tyrants and despots. And maybe it's time that we start looking at a League of Democratic States, which start putting principled foreign policy as an objective rather than continual simple real politic and petty economic agendas. Uh, thank you uh, very much for those words. I want to thank all three of you for your participation. I hope we were able to, 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 to respect your time given, and I do appreciate your generosity. Uh, that, that concludes the talk for today. Uh, Mr. Boulogne.